Hi, good morning. My name is Mark Bradford. I'm a, an associate professor here in the school. Uh, my expertise is actually on soil organisms and carbon cycling. Um, nice for me, actually, that two of our panelists today, their, their original expertise is also in um, working on bugs in soil and how that affects um, ecosystem process rates. I, I do have a guilty secret to share. Um, I'm not an urban ecologist. Shocking. Um, but I, I'm, I'm honored to, um, to moderate this session for, t for two reasons. One, I, th I don't think Colleen knows this, but um, I grew up in the northwest of England. My middle school and my high school were actually literally on the edge of Birkenhead Park, which was the first public park in the world. And when Olmsted visited England in 1850, um, it's sort of that park was a major inspiration for him to, to introduce sort of the naturalistic design into places like Central Park. So I grew up running through the natural woodlands for my cross-country classes in the natural woodlands in, in Birkenhead Park. The other reason um, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be here is that since I joined the school in 2009, I've been working in New York City. Uh, I've been working um, very generously actually through support of New York City Parks and Recreation and, and, the, uh, and the US Forest Service, their urban research there, um, um, on part of the New York City's Millennium Trees Initiative. So um, such experiences have impressed on me that I have a hell of a lot to learn, a hell of a lot to learn if I'm in to engage any of my science in a relevant way um, with, with practice relevant issues. Um, the nice thing for me on this session is that our three panelists between them, and, and they won't thank me for saying this, have more than 70 years experience in working um, on these particular topics. So we're going to organize this session a little bit differently to the previous one. This is the, the only time you're really going to hear from me. Uh, what we're going to do is each speaker is going to come up and they're going to talk for 15 minutes and we're going to hold questions. The idea being is that as quickly as possible, we'd like to get the panelists onto the chairs here. And, um, and when you ask questions, let's, let's keep them brief and focused. And when they give answers, they will also intend to keep them brief and focused. So as many of you as possible kind of on the floor, if you like, can be engaged in this conversation about um, how wild urban parks should be. So all three panelists and the way we've organized it, they're going to touch on specific case studies and also sort of broader conceptual issues. But if you like, we're going to sort of, we're going to organize it in the way that you might write about a healthcare study if you're in, in the, writing for the New York Times. We're going, to fight, we're going to start with the grandma, right? We're going to focus on a specific case study, and then we're going to walk, work our way back up towards, if you like, the healthcare system. Um, the idea being is that we're really going to move from maybe from, from, from very tangible questions to, to things that maybe are, are slightly less tangible or more philosophical questions. So Professor Margaret Carrero is a professor at the University of Louisville. Um, she has interests spanning from ecosystem ecology to urban ecology, and she will lead us off. She'll be followed by Dr. Susan Malik McKenna, who's the executive director for Chicago Wilderness. And to conclude, we have Professor Liam Henahan from DePaul University, Another ecosystem ecologist um, with, with expertise in, in studying soil animals and processes, but for the last 15 years, he's been focusing much more within the urban system. Um, as an Englishman, um, naturally, you know, I, I like, and a natural scientist, I like things to be defined. So when we talk about how wild can a park be, I want to know what a park is. So I went to the Oxford English Dictionary, um, and I looked up urban park. And there is no definition for urban park. It's a term that doesn't exist. So maybe we've made a new term. It's very Shakespearean just by having this conference. But if you look for the original definition of, of what a park is from 1222, it's an enclosed tract of land held by royal grant or prescription and reserved for keeping and hunting deer and other game. <laughs> so, it, it sounds pretty wild to me. Um, Margaret. Well. Oh. Good morning, and uh, I have to say that I'm very proud to represent wild grandmas everywhere. So, um, so I am, I guess, the grandma case study, and uh, and I'm also really, really very happy to be here at, amongst all you folks um, and interested, so enthusiastic about uh, the role that uh, the multifaceted roles that uh, parks can play in our cities. So. Um, so um, I'll be talking today about some insights that um, I got uh, myself from a study of one specific park in Louisville, uh, Cherokee Park, and thanks to Stuart for setting me up with that and some lovely photographs. And um, of course, one of the multifaceted roles, you know, one of the roles of, of some of our urban parks is that they can be places 
for conserving our local biotic heritage and provide a sense of place in that way as well. And uh, when I went to the dictionary to find out what the definition of wild would be, um, here are some. Growing without human aid or care, foreboding and forbidding. And uh, it seems to me like there's a lot of urban parks out there that already meet that definition. <laughs> and that's because of decades of deferred management and a philosophy of let nature take its course, nature knows best. And with the changing um, uh, biotic scene around cities in the last century, that has meant a lot more exotic species invasions, particularly by vines and shrubs. And uh, especially when you have uh, vines, I mean, look at this. It's impenetrable. It's uninviting from a human perspective. And from a biotic expect, uh, perspective, it's degraded. And there's been a lot of native biodiversity loss. And here's uh, one of our main villains in the Ohio Valley region, the Amur honeysuckle, which forms these really dense thickets throughout um, the parks. And uh, you can imagine that people trying to take a walk through the park, if they get past the vines, um, may have a bit of anxiety about what uh, maybe bipedal mammal, mammal might uh, lie ahead around the bend. And, and, and people uh, do feel that way in some, in some of these parks. Um, so one of the main points uh, I want to leave you with today, though, is not only do societal responses and uh, make a difference in the ecological condition of parks, which I think most people can readily see, but with this particular case study, I want to um, make you aware that the ecological responses and things that occur in the parks with the biotic community can also affect societal um, institutions for those that take care of the parks as well. So um, all those years and decades of deferred management then have led to uh, considerable um, degradation of nature. And that feeds back then on less pu public contact with the natural areas in many of these parks, particularly the wooded ones, and less uh, support for them. So how can we change the direction of this downward spiral? And uh, I'd like to share with you some insights from the city of Louisville and its relationship with Cherokee Park. Um, Cher it, uh, Cherokee Park is one of um, 16 Olmstead parks in Louisville. And in fact, um, while Ch Central Park was uh, Olmstead's first park, our system in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, were, were his last in the 1890s. But um, the take home lesson from, from this was that in order to change that downward spiral, it took a crisis that I'll tell you about that changed the trajectory of both the natural areas in the park and hence the societal institutions that take care of the natural areas. And that for me, it was a great, revel you know, real revelation that the condition of the parks and the, and the, the plant communities in particular, those parks, aren't just due to the biophysical context in those parks, the, the heat island or the pollution coming in, et cetera, but to the social context and the importance of societal relationships in the parks as, as drivers of, of the park's biodiversity. So these are truly socio-ecological ecosystems. Um, and as time permits, I will tell you a little update about the current status of the plant community in Cherokee Park's woodland. Um, so here are some delightful images from uh, the early stages of the park um, when Olmsted and his uh, son's uh, firm uh, started it and uh, were taking, actually managing it for the first few decades. And uh, recreation started then to start taking more hold in the park versus the natural areas. But you can get to see uh, what the park looked like. And it was a very well-beloved park by the people. It, really one of the favorite parks in the city and a lot of attachment to it so that when and one early April day in 1974 and I don't know if you were may not have been living in the city then but um, Stuart but a tornado an EF4 tornado very powerful tornado came up within the boundaries of the city okay and cut a 10 mile swath through it and um, that swath included Cherokee Park, and it was devastating. And uh, you can see how people felt about it in some of these quotes here. 
The limbs of huge maple trees are hanging like broken arms from a mall torso. Um, Cherokee Park was gone, where once you could stand and look into a forest, now you could see clear to the other side of the park. This uh, was a tragedy, and, and you've got to give the city of Louisville credit because they were dealing with a lot, right? The city had been hit. Not all of the city, but many neighborhoods in the city had been hit. They had to deal with that crisis. But within a week, and I'll just switch to this, within a week, the mayor set up a citizens committee to focus on what to do about this issue in the park. There were citizens groups that came up. One of them incorporated themselves called Trees Incorporated, and they actually raised $100,000 for the park. The, um, there were many public meetings, and the committee finally did write the very first FEMA um, proposal for funding the restoration of that park and got a quarter of a million dollars. And within two years, Okay, they planted 2,500 trees in the park, 5,000 shrubs, okay? And uh, on this great day in 1976, uh, they're out there celebrating with the mayor and everything. The Parks and Recreation folks, whom I interviewed a few years back, told me they had the philosophy of, well, we've now fixed the problem, and we'll let nature heal itself. Well, with hindsight, <laughs> we all know that what was going to happen um, yes, the city acted really very quickly on this, but the natural environment, the seed banks, all that, with, with the destruction of a tree canopy, you know exotic vines and shrubs got the upper hand very quickly. And within about 20 or so years, it was a, a mess, a thicket of vines and shrubs from uh, many of them, most of them exotics that had taken over and the forest was degraded. However, the evolution of social, uh, of institutions to take care of the park was still evolving, coming from the parks and recreation people and those citizens groups. They banded together to form the Louisville Friends of Olmstead Parks. And that in 1981, when the Olmstead Parks Conservancy nationally got started, and it morphed into the Louisville Olmstead Parks Conservancy. And by 1988, they had formed this very important public-private partnership with the city. Metro Parks and LOPC. And LOPC then was given, you know, okay, you're going to manage the parks. And this increased the capacity for management enormously because they were able to fundraise, get grants, start a volunteer um, groups, and do a lot of publicity campaigns. And um, in, from 2007, they finally raised something like $4 million for the Olmstead Parks two million of which went to Cherokee Park alone for a campaign to remove exotic shrubs and vines. And that's about when, you know, I got involved with my students uh, setting some baseline plots before they started the campaign, different kinds of baseline plots for different questions, so that we could gauge then how successful these efforts are. And, um, you know, will we have the return of the natives, or to what extent are we just going to get the return of the non-natives all over again from the seed bank, et cetera? So here's a little bit of data, some graphs. Um, is there a point? Is this the pointer? No, it's not. There's no pointer. Oh, shoot. Can you get me back up? Not pointer. That's the pointer. All right. Thank you. Whoops. There. Now we got to get through all this. Sorry, folks. Um, should have done this first. There. So what you're going to see are from one set of these long-term plots, there are eight paired plots where we you know, got data initially, and then uh, in 2009, we, one of them remained thick with honeysuckle. That's the honeysuckle in blue. And the other had the honeysuckle removed. And this is data from five years later, five growing seasons later. And this is in total, this is the cover of both, of all the plants in, in there. And this is split, splitting those up into the exotic species and the native species in terms of cover. And in the spring, for the spring uh, plants, you can see that exotics are, in terms of cover, uh, are having a little bit of an upper hand there, and mostly due to garlic, mustard, etc. cetera. Um, but the good news is, that many of the species are, there is some resilience in the, in the seed and root bank, and 
the, some of the species are coming back. So this is species number, and you can see that the increase in total species number is due primarily to native species. And the quality of those species is uh, surprisingly good. Yes, we, we have some of the weedier native species coming in with a conservation uh, coefficient index in the low values, but we have some very high values, really nice ones coming back, making a comeback. And for the summer herbs, we have um, definitely the natives are, are doing very well. But I have to say, and, and, the, and same thing with species number, okay, that uh, species richness here, the natives are really returning much more so in the removal plots than in the control plots. And, uh, but I have to say a lot of them are the weedier species, the ones that can get around and, and, and uh, like white snake root and, uh, and pokeweed initially, and, but there's a lot of species richness there in the summertime. Um, overall, in another design, we determined that the quality of the plant community, um, 32 um, of the species had, that we found in this uh, study in 2014 had very high um, coefficients of conservatism, and uh, that two-thirds of them are native to Kentucky. So in terms of sense of place, this is, this is good news, you know. And it, it agreed well with a much more detailed study by Harrigan, where she also found 62% native uh, herbs. The all-important thing, though, for me in particular was how are the tree seedlings doing? What's going on with tree recruitment? Because without little smaller trees, you're not going to have a forest in 50 years, okay? And then no woodlands. And believe me, they were suppressed. And um, what we found, the difference in these other permanent plots of a larger scale here, oops, that, eh, that uh, between, this is a per hectare basis, that the tree seedlings went up by 15-fold in that interval. But even more important to me is that they made it through, a lot of them made it through to be saplings, okay? They tripled. And species richness, number of species did as well. Very specious part of the country, <laughs> country here. A lot of great tree species. However, you can't just do one thing, right? You remove, you know, you're removing now biomass from the, by taking out honeysuckle, by taking out vine cover, more light, and of course the invasives are going to come back, at least some of them. But you know, how well are they doing? And uh, between 2007 and 2014, it seems they are increasing in these kind of plots. And the ones that are really the big winners were garlic mustard, but a whole host of vines, which for me are the really important critters. So because of their ability to strangle tree seedlings, saplings, etc. <laughs> so yeah, we're going to have to have return cycles for invasive management. And I do believe that even Sisyphus would uh, commiserate with natural areas managers on this, uh, in this respect. Because of uh, these, the, the vines, etc., coming up alongside some great tulip poplar seedlings, but there's Virginia creeper, a native vine, and there's Ampelopsis, a non-native vine. So, how wild can city parks get? How can we get from bad wild to good wild? And uh, I think the institution of that public-private partnership and uh, this different pool of increased long-term funds for supporting a trained, knowledgeable staff in natural areas management was vital, as well as uh, starting a great volunteer program and partnering with academics who can do that nitty-gritty stuff of measuring the efficacy. And it's a training ground for ecology students. I've had um, oh, at least 20 undergraduates trained on this project. Um, and col having cultural events, flower, you know, getting people into the woods again to appreciate what's been done has been really important. Um, and uh, so they do wildflower walks, all those kinds of things that you do to get people into the woods. And uh, this raises some issues, but uh, given the time, I'm just going to show you this, I think, a lot of reason for optimism in terms of, uh, you know, just what is the biodiversity potential of natural areas with this changing paradigm and people supporting these parks. I think uh, we haven't really seen how well, you know, I think it can improve quite a bit. You can certainly see that going from this to this is a remarkable change. And this is from Cherokee Park, these photos they took. Um, and that, you know, we 
can explore, I think, reasonably what kind of conservation roles these parks can play in terms of habit, providing habitat for um, other species, as stepping stones and corridor networks that lo from local to regional and perhaps even international scales with, with uh, migratory birds. So, um, and, you know, make the point that r restoring nature, you know, brings a lot of people gratification and pleasure, really, the hard work. It, it's, I think, important to do. And there's been great programs there involving the public. So I want to end with a um, different, perhaps offering a different definition of wild uh, that's also in the dictionary, that of alluring, of passionately eager, enthusiastic. But definitely, they, these systems are not ones that can grow without human aid or care if we want to keep them in a good quality condition with respect to conservation roles. And uh, in a bit of a lovely poem by Paula Kepi, a, a local poet. And I want to thank a lot of undergraduates, some grads and others, but particularly Eric Moore and Eli Levine and master students in my lab but also the Olmsted Parks Conservancy Woodland Management Crew, the, they call themselves the Park Nuts, and, uh, and this, this park truck has done a lot for advertising in the park, that they're doing all, because at first people say, what are you doing to the woods, you know, and when are you taking all the green stuff away, you know, and uh, they were publicity people, really, on the ground in the park during that effort. And, and really, Ma Major Waltman, he's not a military person, that's his name. Anyway, he's the Natural Areas Manager for Olmstead Parks Conservancy, and he's been a delight to work with, and we still continue um, talking about things we can do together in the parks to, that bring together science with the restoration activities. So um, thanks a lot, and uh, if you have any questions, I'll be delighted to try and answer them. Straight out. So, so please hold your questions for the next for the next um, until we're here for the panel. Yeah, oh, okay. I'm being shooed out of here. All right. That's what we're doing. We hung out last night. I feel like I can speak to her that way. Um, good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Okay. The reason I just did it that way is because clearly. Um, first, Mark introduced us and said, I'm not an urban ecologist, but who wouldn't wear kind of a suit and keens? So I say that he's an urban ecologist. I also would say, because you said you couldn't find a definition, that's the beauty of it. We all are. We're all urban ecologists because it's an evolving concept of what ecology is in a city setting. And uh, I believe that as we learn and continue to apply, um, we combine our efforts in an optimistic way. I wanted to just start by saying how honored I am to be here today uh, amongst really esteemed uh, group who've just br brought about so many successes, and I've learned from them uh, over the years, and I'm just excited to be here. And I, I have to give uh, a shout out to Rebecca, um, talk about optimism. So, you know, I've, I've watched Detroit, I've watched what's been going on, and, you know, you could say, what, four to 6,000 buildings coming down a year. Um, and yet, you've got this spark plug here um, who is able to take um, vacant lemons and make ecological lemonade. Um, so that optimism, and to build off what Margaret just said, um, your last definition, we are wild then, right? We're passionate, we're eager, we wanna make all this stuff happen together. So that's pretty exciting. So um, I, I oversee an organization called Chicago Wilderness. It'll be 20 years old. Uh, next year. Sir Peter uh, was one of the founding members with me and about six other organizations, and uh, it's, been, it's been an evolving, exciting thing, as I think we've all understood what it means to be uh, looking at an urban context and looking at nature and, and how we're part of it. Uh, so our focus, and we've actually changed our mission statement from really biodiversity-driven to preserving, improving, and expanding nature and people nature and, and quality of life. And um, that expanding nature, we used to say create in some of my post-industrial context, but the expanding nature is really about that every site you're at could have a natural you know, aspect to it. It's, it might have turf right now. We know the bad things about turf, 
but it's green. Um, but as we add other species, um, as we love it differently, um, it continues to be even better nature. And I think uh, as we all look at, at these spots um, of all different types uh, and the, the potential that they have, uh, we want to help lead uh, our 200 members of uh, Cook Forest Preserve Districts, Park Districts, Municipalities, the Nature Conservancy, Open Space Conservation Groups, and Community Gardening Groups across the region who are, are part of our effort. So it's really about, and I think we've all said this today, we're all talking about wild, and I think ultimately we're talking about people uh, in the wild or in nature and what our relationship is. And, and it really is, we came together at Chicago Wilderness literally because we recognize humans had an impact on nature negatively and positively and had the ability to help bring back more of the positive of nature, more of the opportunities of nature. And, and the way to do that is to become relevant. And I really believe um, this might sound, I don't know, people might disagree. I'll look forward to hearing that. But I personally think the natural world, ecosystem work, biodiversity is um, in a lot of respects to many different audiences not relevant to their day, daily life, not relevant to the economics of their region, not necessarily relevant to public health because we haven't learned or we haven't shared what we've learned. And I think in order for us to have a long-term constituency around ecological work, it needs to be a much broader constituency and it needs to be sustained. And the way it's sustained is by engaging in the other issues in the region that people see as necessary to flourish and survive and be resilient over time. So this is our region, four states, 38 counties, 500 municipalities, 10 million people, and I added that little 575 billion gross regional product from a U.S. Department of Commerce Bureau of Economic Analysis. I'm not even quite sure what that means, but I thought it was kind of impressive and had dollar signs next to it, so what the heck. So this is what we talked about, people and nature. It's all connected. So what we've done is we have, um, we've, we've mapped. Um, we started in 2002 literally with people with markers on paper saying this is an important area and this is an important year. This is before we were spatial, geospatial at all. In the past, I'd say, five, six years, we've started going into geographic information systems, and we have these layers, and we've become this completely com confusing set of data in our region. Um, so I picked a few. And um, what we talk about is our region's essential lands and waters. And that's how we look at our region and how we want to embrace people and get people engaged in nature. This is our freshwater system three, which are important lakes, rivers, streams, uh, et cetera. Our essential lands, hub layer one. These terms are going away, just so you know. These are important assemblages, large and small, uh, important connectors, uh, but 545,000 acres in this region are preserved open space. However, 347,000 of it are actual natural open spaces, and the rest are recreational golf courses, picnic groves, etc. Then you got that human layer, um, and this is a really bad example. Uh, it's the schools on the southeast side of the city into the Calumet region. It's just the schools. So imagine when you add all these different layers, and Baltimore is doing amazing stuff with this, with the urban tree canopy and the LTER, the, the relationship between these things as we look at the work we want to do on the ground is so imperative and, and such an asset. That, you know, everything in our region, even in the hardest communities, there are incredible assets, and that's how I think we need to look at things. So our essential region is the lands and the waters and the people, and the essential aspect of it is what we need to get across in order to be relevant in this broader landscape. So we reorganized around specific efforts. Um, oak ecosystems, priority species, water. Landowners is a big one because, and you'll see in a little bit, so many of our natural areas are actually private property. Maybe corporate, homeowners, could be Department of Transportation highways or tollways or what have you, but not what you consider the traditional conservation types of lands. We don't have really any relationship. Our 200 organizations, there's not really, we may know them, we may work together when a road's going in and we want green infrastructure, or it's going across an endangered species or something, but there's no relationship about their land and ours and the, and the potential connector. Beyond the choir is what I'll spend um, more of my time on, and data. All of these things are important to make the best, most effective use and engagement of our 200 organizations. So it's just simple things like how we coordinate our efforts, how we measure, which I think is extremely important, how we track, and how we tell our stories. 
I think are really important as well, and that's also linking to the relevance. So I'm just starting with water because I think it's important to note that um, we, we went through this exercise recently of looking at all the watersheds and looking, so you can see that blue outline is actually the outline of the Chicago Wilderness Region, which we always called fuzzy. Uh, because it really was a lot of people saying, oh, but don't forget that green space. And, and now it's algorithmic of, of sites of 50 acres and less were just added in the past year. But really, when you take such a large region, how will we organize ourselves? And watersheds are an incredible way to do that. And by the way, Frederick Law Olmsted, who we've all talked about, who we all adore, do you know he was a water engineer in the Civil War? And so his connection to water was critical. And um, we have a lot of discussions about how would he look at things today. Um, he believed in the natural areas. He knew that native plants, et cetera, had a part of this. And um, I think he would, he'd be really into this. How's that for scientific? Um, so, but so as you look at our, our different kinds of stormwater um, areas, our, our watersheds, they have different challenges. Um, they have different demographics oftentimes. They have different economies. It might be ag. It might be... Uh, uh, industrial areas, who knows? Um, and we can potentially tell stories and build some relationships in those areas, which are still incredibly large. So in the water context, we've said, what are we doing to our land? Well, we have combined sewer overflow flows. We have MS4 communities. We're developing. As such, we have stormwater infiltration and surface flow problems and storage problems and water quality problems. Well, guess what? Us in that ecology world do some pretty cool things that are directly impactful on those particular challenges. We just haven't really done a very good job measuring it and demonstrating it, in my opinion, to the broader region, which I think would then bring additional value um, that could be looked at in a financial way that could bring more resources in. At, just as a question, anybody here think we have enough resource for our work? Anybody? Anybody? Seriously? Okay. Wow. Great. I'm looking forward to talking about that. Um, <laughs> I'm talking about, you know, we all say we need more staff, we need more money, whatever. I actually believe in our region, and probably most regions, the resources are there. We just haven't tapped them. Um, and I think that's part of the constituency building. And then how do we do this? We can do these types of efforts, and they can be worked on on our traditional um, ecological sites, but also these what we're calling underutilized land. I called it marginal and got beat up over it, so I'm saying underutilized. Because a railroad corridor, um, uh, a utility um, easement, the highways, etc., those are underutilized. They have that p potential to be that expanded nature. And by doing that, um, we're again bringing in more of a constituency, but we're also demonstrating how you can solve problems. So we looked at our water, and we looked at the cones of depression, new term for me, thank you very much. We're taking water from Lake Michigan, and then in areas we're taking water from wells. Well, we've actually had uh, aquifer recovery happening, but now further out where there's been more development, we're seeing aquifer declines. And actually there's a great relationship between stormwater and water storage, et cetera, and those aquifers. And in the ecological context, even though sometimes the recharge may take 20 or 30 years, um, there's a role that we can and should play uh, that intersects with the work that we're doing. And then resiliency, climate. Um, the HUD program that's been going across, it's gone, it has 72 areas across the U.S. We have four in Illinois. This is the one in East DuPage River. And this flooding that happened four years ago impacted 20 different municipalities. Uh, there needs to be a challenge there. Where really is the floodplain and the floodway, and how do we look at our lands differently to address that? So combine those things, and you've got all these different challenges, but also these incredible opportunities of intersection that we need to be looking at. Oak ecosystems are one of those. We've mapped Illinois. The rest of our region is underway right now. And we looked at um, 1830s, 1939, and 2010 to see what we have. The Sad news is we have 17% of our oak ecosystems remaining. The good news is that translates to 170,000 acres of oaks. Optimism. Think about that incredible resource. 70% of it is on private property. So we need to take a look at that important um, species and that important ecosystem because they're throughout the area and have great benefit and are also quite resilient. Priority species. In 2010, we got down to 1,700 to focus on. Anybody? Imagine how you measure that. Um, we came together, and we're now going to focus on eight. 
uh, critters first, and um, we're doing a nominating process right now. We actually just sent this out yesterday to remind people to nominate, and we said, yes, that's cheesy, um, and we likely won't find unicorns prancing in our oak woodlands. However, there are really important species. How do we prioritize work around them, and then in doing so, demonstrate our ability to coordinate and collaborate? Lastly, data and member tools. There's so much information out there. How do we share it? How do we build capacity? We do it by building the choir, expanding the choir. And both in, in our communities, our businesses, et cetera, it's building that conservation ethic, and that's done by de developing relevancy. And then it's building capacity of our members. That was that raise your hand if you have enough resources. And again, I, I'm totally going to be talking to you afterwards. I want your, I want your, uh, your special sauce. Um, but we need to build capacity, and we need to build momentum. And then we need to step out of the way and let that continue to build. And it's not leaving nature in its own way, but it's the kind of the communication and the communities we need to develop around this. And there's all kinds of degrees of engagement. If we have 10 million people in our region, they're not all going to be out there pulling garlic mustard. But they may just be aware of the issue. And if we've done it right, it's connecting to their everyday life in a way that they're starting to understand how important that is. How do they react then? Uh, talk to a decision maker, vote, whatever it is. But as you go further, what is that number of people you need for that deep action? Unknown, but we know it's a lot more, and it's not just going to be within the choir where we're able to achieve that. So um, I, we call it Beyond the Choir because I will say in Chicago, it's still a very racially divided area. Um, we say talking about doing work with underserved or people of color. I mean, we are awful about that, and we talk about it, and we say we're going to do it, but we don't know how to do it. And I think it's because we haven't attempted to communicate with all different kinds of populations in our region. Our goal is to look at, with great forecasts, diversity um, in the regional, geographic, cultural, economic, and generational. And need to look at all those aspects, because each region really has different makeups based on the economy in the area, what have you. But I thought this was an in interesting quote. Basically. We have monocultures, which we know are problems with plants. They're also problems with homo sapiens. Uh, and without more diverse relationships and communities we work with, again, where's the relevance? Where's the impact that's going to build a good constituency? I love this one. I actually want to say it because I like to swear, because I can, because I'm quoting somebody. Assumption that folks have the day-to-day -day survival mode to deal with whale saving um, just ain't our shit. They couldn't be more wrong. So you've probably heard of Green for All in Oakland. They do great work. But there's an assumption that we make in so many ways about uh, what people think, what they care about, and you know this kind of thing about meeting and listening and getting to know communities is a critical aspect. When we actually know that ethnic minorities are actually some of the strongest supporters of policies around climate, which of course I immediately link to ecology, because there are so many things we can do both in the mitigation and adaptation framework. Uh, work that not only the question of do humans have something to do with it, but, but is there actually something happening? Guess what? We have uh, more belief and engagement among the Hispanic and black populations than the white populations. However, the choir that we typically work with in the conservation world is typically middle to upper income white. So there's a huge disconnect here um, that we're not paying attention to, and we're missing, we're missing the train. And uh, if we want a constituency for the long haul, we have to rethink our engagement and how, again, to demonstrate the work we're doing as relevant to quality of life, to public health, et cetera. So some of the ways we've done that, I'm hoping it's not too um, blurry, is um, actually this is part of my dissertation where we did ethnographic work across the city in nine out of our 77 communities. Um, to find out what mattered to people with regards to climate, what was going to engage people. In one community, it was art. Another community, it was urban ag. Another community, it was safety, um, because the understory, we were talking about 20,000 shrubs, or I'm trying to remember what Margaret said, in the Chicago Park District system, we took all the understory down in the 60s because there was a, a woman's group that said it's not safe. So we went to the tree and turf landscape. Bringing it back has safety implications possibly more in perception than reality. Uh, but taking down fences and making it more accessible and thus making it more safe for people to engage is a really critical aspect of what we need to do. 
Joan Nassar from University of Michigan did great visual elicitation work with us and found that just by having like a mown strip in front of a, front of a native landscape, it felt like it was cared for. It felt more accessible, uh, more comfortable, more engaging. So, so looking at the different types of ways that we can tell the story about our native landscapes, about our ecology, how it connects to important issues, as well as the visuals aspect that's going to bring people in as well are very important. Faith in Place is a group started by Reverend Claire Butterfield. It's a group that works just with religious institutions. Uh, we got to speak to the Synod, the leaders of the major religions in the Chicago region. Pretty, pretty trippy, I must say. Uh, and that was at my old gig, talking about energy efficiency and climate, and I could just see the eyes glazing. So the way we look at it now is I, I don't go to great, big, super important audiences until I have my act together and I have a message and an actions that they can undertake. Doing dog and pony shows are great, but that gives us that green, we're green. And I think it's really important for us to have bold conversations um, and not be wimpy around climate. And what I say about that is we have research, all of us, and we really have seen great adaptation studies and forecasts, and the reality is that we're not, not a lot of people in the planning are saying, okay, well, these oaks likely aren't gonna make it which is painful. White oak is our state tree. But what's coming up? We're already two hardiness zones different from 1990. So we need to be a little more bold in the way that we look at our region, take some chances in the trees that we plant, the landscapes we take underway, really claim the water challenges and how we can solve them. Um, and that allows us to really be planning for a long-term future. And the business aspect. Risky business. Uh, um, Mayor Bloomberg, and Hank Paulson, former Secretary of Treasury, came together with a range of people, and they're trying to make that economic connection to climate. We need to jump on board and see how that work can be done together. I'm not going to go into this, but there are words that are better than others. We should consider it. I'll use biodiversity. How about fish and wildlife? Uh, ecosystem services, nature's benefits, or natural economics. The kinds of things that are going to be more immediately accessible in a verbal way is important as well. So I'll leave with Henry Ford, a great industrialist uh, who came up with that car thing, um, which we might say has been a negative <laughs> impact, um, but also a very innovative uh, person. And um, I think this is an important way to think about what we can be doing in the long haul. Thank you. get to my my show it's okay so how do I get back to my show pretty sure you just need to yeah, 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 yeah. yep there you go excellent uh, thank you very much uh, such a such a pleasure to be here it's um this building is just astonishing. It's, it's kind of like being in a uh, cathedral in a uh, in a treehouse, uh, and I appreciate it. Listen, I apologize in advance. Um, my my voice. Uh, I woke up. I couldn't speak this morning, so um, my voice may break a little bit. The good news is I've been taking secrets and fisherman's friends, so I'm as high as a kite. So <laughs> who knows what's going to happen? Um, so listen, like mo most of my work over the last uh, 20, well, 18 years or so has been in Chicago wilderness, uh, in uh, primarily uh, in the forest preserves, kind of at more kind of suburban work, uh, suburban uh, sites, kind of areas that look very like traditional biodiversity um, kind of locations, research locations. But I also have an interest in kind of what I would consider to be a true, true urban uh, park closer uh, down um, into the city of Chicago itself, particularly in the Chicago Park District, which is um, it's an old park district with a lot of acreage, over 8,000 acres. So what I'm talking about today is kind of, it's not so much my own work, I'll, I'll say a little bit about that towards the end, but I've taken a kind of a journalistic interest in um, 
Jackson Park, some of the restoration projects that are going on there, which I think um, are relevant to the sort of things that we are, are uh, going to uh, talk about. So in conclusion, I'm kidding. I like to, uh, I'm, you know, I'm not given to brevity, so it, it always seems like a good idea just to kind of tell you pretty much up front kind of what the take home um, message is. So, um, and part of the strategy here is as well is that if any of the language here in this conclusion is a little inscrutable right now, if I've done my job in 15 minutes, uh, it should be a little bit more uh, clear. So uh, Jackson Park, big park, south side of um, uh, downtown uh, Chicago, um, is installing right as we speak uh, what I would call like a hybrid conservation design, which is uh, designed around kind of um, you know, the historical legacy of an Olmsted Park, uh, but it's also trying to do the work of uh, biodiversity conservation uh, at the same uh, time. It's, this, it's a deeply historic park, meaning that it was created, designed by uh, Olmsted uh, in the um, 1800s. But the natural areas work in it is being, um, is being designed under the principles of what I would call ecocentric uh, restoration. That's kind of restoration, biodiversity conservation, in the spirit of doing things for nature rather than necessarily for our uh, benefits. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, that. And ultimately what the, the vision is, is to have you know, an iconic Midwestern habitat, one that is kind of, on a global scale, really rare. Midwestern oak savanna, it's kind of a high priority ecosystem, but there will be one installed in the heart of uh, downtown uh, Chicago, but in what ends up being a very novel setting. So let's, let's see if I can make uh, sense of that. Uh, so, you know, Jackson Park, big, big uh, park. Uh, Jackson, uh, or sorry, uh, Olmsted and Vaux uh, put together um, an, a, a thousand acre south uh, uh, park, it was called at the, at the time of the design. There was two primary areas you can see on the right the green space is uh, what is now Jackson Park, and uh, to the left of it is um, Washington um, uh, Park. Jackson Park ended up in the 1890s being selected as the site for the uh, Columbian uh, Exposition, uh, kind of the World Fair. And ultimately, after the World Fair closed its doors, it reverted back to um, parkland. Um, as I said, I've kind of taken really only an interest in this park over the last several months, and even kind of in preparation for this talk, I learned a lot about it. In fact, last night I learned about um, some of the work that Suzanne uh, Malik McKenna had done in the park um, during her tenure uh, in the mayor's um, office at the, at the time. So uh, plenty of interesting things going on there. It, it kind of historically has had a lot of green features in addition to kind of amenities, recreational uh, amenities. Part of the um, recreational, uh, sorry, part of the green design, the green uh, legacy of the park is uh, called Wooded Island, on which uh, there is um, Osaka uh, Garden, which is a Japanese style garden that was associated with the Colombian uh, ex, uh, exposition. Yoko Ono's uh, first American installation piece will be installed in the park in uh, the summer of 2016, it's called uh, Sky uh, Landing, and she was there for the inauguration, so it's coming ahead, but she was there recently just to look at the, at the, at the site. A big concern uh, with the uh, folks doing kind of cons conservation work in the park is to retain these Olmstedian features. Olmsted was particularly keen on this idea of having um, vantage points where you would look over a body of water and you could see kind of naturalistic uh, vegetation and you could also see some of the historic uh, uh, buildings. So in part of the, the, the design, they want to trade and stay tr true to the spirit of Olmsted while instituting this more kind of eccentric, ecocentric uh, oriented uh, design. So two major things going on in the park. There's a kind of preservation of the historic components and there's restoration of this oak uh, savanna going on simultaneously. And I like the language that the people who are involved with the design are using to talk about this. They re refer to it as a, an entangled project. So it's entangled kind of according to four principles. On the one hand, it's an entanglement of nature and culture. 
right? It's an entanglement of nature and, and culture. There's also an attempt to make compatible the vision of biological conservation alongside the vision of um, maintaining and preserving historical uh, space. And then, of course, there's the language of resilience. You know, the idea is that ultimately when this um, natural area restoration goes into place, of course it'll need ongoing management, but it's got to be designed in, in a certain way so that it, um, there's a certain amount of self-management uh, that goes along um, as, um, as an accompaniment to the pro project. The other important guiding principle, and I think there's a lot to be said about this maybe in the discussion, is uh, issues of sustainability. And for the designer, this means that ultimately the, um, this project, this vision for about 70 acres or so in the middle of Jackson Park won't be sustainable unless it meets the needs of the community while also needing, meeting uh, the needs of uh, conservation of uh, biological uh, diversity, and that, that might be a little bit easier said than done, as I'll, I'll talk about. Um, so I spent uh, some time at the park, like over the last uh, few weeks, and thinking this through. The uh, person who's designing it, or is involved in the vegetation management of it for the city, is Lauren Umick on the, on the left. She's a former student of mine who now works for the park. Park District, and of course, it's an intentional design. So even ultimately, when this oak savanna in the middle of the city looks like an oak savanna, a decision has been made about each and every plant, you know, that's been installed in the in the uh, in the place. This, I guess, is Lauren throwing up her hands and kind of, you know, the enorm the enormity of the task um, ahead of her. Um, you know, so right now it doesn't look great, right? So you can't um, do the conservation omelet without breaking a few eggs. So a lot of vegetation had to be removed, installation of a lot of vegetation. It'll probably start looking like something in five years' time or so. Um, and ultimately, uh, conservation-oriented restoration people, ecological restoration people, often talk about these things as being 500-year projects. Now, I don't know about you, but it is kind of nice not to be held responsible or accountable, which is what happens if it's a 500-year project. So it really has to um, never make promises beyond the lifetime of your career, one person said to me, uh, and I, 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 I get that. Um, so ultimately, they're going to uh, install a 70-acre um, savanna in uh, Jackson Park. A savanna, I think most of you know, is... Um, kind of a felicitous combination of scattered timbers, relatively few trees, but some trees, and um, kind of relatively low-lying herbaceous uh, vegetation. One of the things that is true about mid Midwestern savannas is that you uh, do get species there that have a, a reasonable fidelity for this type of habitat. You're not going to get them in prairie. You're not going to get them in, uh, in uh, oak woodland. Oak savanna was on the verge in the 1970s of disappearing. Uh, one of, there's very few remnants of it le left. So a lot of the restoration conservation efforts in Chicago have been around the rehabilitation of this almost disappeared ecosystem. Just as an aside, I know I don't have a huge amount of time for sides, but uh, when I uh, graduated from, as an undergraduate in the 80s, um, one of the external examiners who came in at the time said, uh, if you're interested in conservation and you want to do it in the tropics, you've got to do it now because tropical rainforest is gone. Um, not true. Turns out it's not true. Not, not that rainforest doesn't have its problem, but some of the systems in and around Chicago are globally significant. And so we have this really extraordinary situation where we can do global scale conservation efforts in the heart of a vast metropolitan uh, region, which is, um, is certainly odd. So the kind of guiding principle for the project is this notion of ecological restoration. We'll come back to this in a moment or two. But ecological restoration, this is one of the first ways of depicting it. There's all sorts of problems uh, with this way of, of viewing it. But on the, uh, what the graph is, is uh, suggesting is that you know, the original ecosystem would have had relatively high species count and kind of um, lots of ecosystem services. And then over a period of time, it gets degraded, and you see it in the bottom left of the graph where it's lost species and the uh, ecosystem services have been uh, compromised. And so then the idea of restoration is that you are trying to return the system. You're playing around with history, with time, in, to some extent, to bring it back to that original condition. 
it's no longer exactly the way restorationists think about it these days, but I will talk about that in a second. I want to put this into some kind of bigger uh, context. One of the reasons why kind of a project like this in a historically iconic park in Chicago doing the business of biodiversity conservation, which is often associated with places that are already naturally wilder, uh, is, is the, kind of is related to the fact that, you know, Chicago in the Midwest, in the context of Illinois, is the place where we have the greatest opportunity for uh, restoration. And the graph on the right is probably the easiest, um, uh, map on the right is probably easiest to, to look at. It's just kind of reminding us that in the state of Illinois, which is, you know, um, a lot of corn, a lot of soybean, um, you know, strangely, what gets left behind from the 1800s is a lot of areas of conservation concern. My students often misread this because it, it looks like it's saying that, you know, you get the greatest number of endangered and threatened species in Chicago, and they assume that's because we're endangering and threatening them. But in fact, it's the other way around. It's those are the areas where you get the greatest number of these species because of the lands that have been left uh, behind. I do this work in the context of the project that uh, Suzanne described, Chicago Wilderness. I've abandoned updating this, di this uh, little uh, graph or this uh, statement because the numbers keep growing. 230, probably th over 300 at this point institutional members of the organization, all of which have some element of biodiversity conservation as part of their core um, mission. And a relatively, you know, a large amount of land Ultimately, uh, there's 370,000 acres of open space that are kind of managed uh, through Chicago Wilderness uh, members. This is the Old Testament of Chicago Wilderness, and not a lot of people have remained as faithful to this as I have, but I love it because of, uh, just because of this um, statement about the overall goal for biodiversity maintenance in Chicago is and I want to parse the sentence just a little bit. It's to protect natural communities of the Chicago region and restore them. So restoring being kind of a, uh, the, the important process. Long-term viability. They need to be restored not just for now, not just for a moment, but ongoing. And why are we doing this? In order to enrich the quality of life for citizens. So it's about people, but it's also you know, to contribute to the uh, preservation of global uh, biodiversity. However, it is an uphill battle. Uh, a lot of the systems around Chicago, even though we have a lot of acreage, uh, this is a report card that CW did about a decade ago. These are not great grades. I would, I would if this was my student, I would say retake those courses. Uh, and essentially, that's what restoration is. We've got a fairly kind of uh, comprehensive understanding of the forces that degrade them. I'm not going to go through them all. The one that has, I've spent most time on is uh, looking at invasive species. This is the way ecologists used to look two years ago. Uh, so this is, I, I spent a summer um, uh, two years ago looking for uh, European buckthorn, common buckthorn in Ireland, where I'd seen it once in my life, you know, when I was a young naturalist. So it's a, it's a species that is kind of a, considered a rarity, conservation concern in Ireland. It's the commonest woody plant in um, Chicago. So a lot of my work has been uh, over the years looking at why this um, is, is the uh, case. So restoration kind of is the go-to strategy in Chicago wilderness because these systems are degraded. But there is kind of there is some real genuine uh, critical responses to, um, to the notion of, of restoration. We've already heard from Stuart this um, kind of dictum uh, that nature's not static. Um, so how exactly, what exactly are you restoring things uh, to you? There's a lot of prevalence of this idea, let nature take its course. I think Margaret uh, talked about that. There is this philosophical objection that it's fake nature that gets produced. I can say more about that because it's entertaining. Um, and then, uh, of course, a lot of the objections are to do with time. You can't reverse time. You can't reverse time. But also, it's, um, you know, if you are deciding that you're going to pick a historic period to which to return a system, you know, what point in time do you, um, when do you choose? Do you put Chicago back under a mile of ice 
and say we're restoring it to the Ice Age? Uh, probably not. So there's more to be uh, said, said about that. So restoration, one way or the other, kind of is involves kind of an inspection of the history of um, systems. And this is a digression that I won't go into, but um, philosophers are very good at kind of reminding us the degree to which we should or should not be taking um, history seriously. I would, I would recommend to you uh, to read the second uh, Untimely Meditation on History by, by Nietzsche. One of the big reminders here is the idea that, you know, we're constantly forgetting things. Even those of you who think you have great memories, tell me where your fingers were five minutes ago. Were they resting on your arm? Were you twiddling them? You know, what was the person beside you doing? We're kind of fundamentally committed to forgetting because if we aren't, we're overwhelmed. So for restoration, the problem is always going to be how much restoration, how much history you want to bed into this process. So there's largely two ways of, of thinking about it. You know, one is kind of, and this is a crude way of putting it, it's kind of history light, meliorative, I would have called it ameliorative um, restoration, which is basically making the environment better in some ways. It makes a reference to history, but not completely. And then there is this hardcore notion of restoration that comes particularly from uh, Bill Jordan, whose work I esteem a lot, called Ecocentric Rest Restoration, where Bill is really concerned about restoration, in some cases, doing the task of putting everything back in place, even the mosquitoes, even the rattlesnakes, even the things that are ultimately inimitable to our health and well-being. A new big new idea in restoration at the moment is this idea that um, since there's no historical analogs for what we're going through at the moment, in a, in a warming world, uh, we should not be thinking about using history as a guide uh, at all. And plenty more to be said about that. It's been very controversial. So listen, last couple of things. You know, um, Jackson Park is dedicated to this kind of stricter notion of historical fidelity to an old system. And yet the weird thing about it is that if you look back to the, um, kind of the beginning of the 1800s at least, if you were to try and locate Jackson Park on this map, it would be in the lake, right? So the, you know, so it's restoration with historical fidelity in this extraordinarily kind of novel uh, way. Does it have benefits? Does this peculiar project have benefits? I'll just mention some of the things that Jordan and his colleagues talk about. One is that even in the city, there should be some kind of opportunity for people to encounter nature in its radical otherness. You know, nature, natural things are different from us. And that's kind of important for us to experience. Maybe a little bit more pragmatically, it reminds us the fact that we're talking about the rarity of oak ecosystems in the, in, in the, in the Midwest is a reminder just of what our impact has been. So we may have an ethical obligation to address some of those uh, concerns. And it also, restoration in this store, in, in this sense, does kind of pay a certain amount of tribute to the intrinsic values of nature. And that's why putting the mosquitoes back in the system may end up being uh, important. Final couple of thoughts. Not everyone is as enthusiastic about this project as maybe I am. Um, you know, and, and legitimately so. There's been some controversy in the, in the neighborhoods. First of all, is it feasible? Is it feasible? Is this really going to, to work? Uh, particularly if it can't be judged for 500 years. This is the issue of scale. Even at 70 acres, this is a tiny, tiny little fragment. And it's very difficult to imagine it being self-sustaining. And the community reaction has been, I'm trying to get to the bottom of this at the moment. The local older person seems not to be as keen on it. She has safety concerns that she has. So the uh, vegetation managers are keeping to a, a very low height, the um, vegetation that they're planting in. Um, and of course, others in the neighborhood just want recreational uh, space. So this is going to be the big challenge for us if we are thinking about kind of rewilding at least aspects of our city parks um, on into the uh, future. i um, saying very little about this because I know I need to um, get out of here. Uh, I have been doing a lot of work over the, over the years um, in a fairly low register, but looking at um, how other city parks are doing in terms of 
even in the absence of very radical uh, pro pro projects like this Jackson Park one, how much are we getting back? This is a favorite organism of mine, Apiella nova. It's a soil mite, probably the commonest mite on the, probably the commonest animal on the planet, and yet most of us probably don't know it. Uh, so we've been looking at uh, populations of this. It's not doing that well. It's certainly in the city, but like not in, in very large uh, numbers. The other project that we're doing, I'd love to say more about it if uh, people want to chat afterwards, is we've been doing a lot of um, soundscape work a lot in the parks throughout the city, doing kind of long-term monitoring of wildlife in, in the parks, and that's been really an ear opener. Uh, so there's a lot of things that are going on in the parks that uh, we urban ecologists at least in our region, have very little awareness of. So in conclusion, weird project, weird blending, but ultimately, you know, it's an ecosystem, ecocentric restoration in the middle of uh, the city in this very novel uh, setting. So uh, thanks a lot. Listen, I do want to thank, um, I do want to thank Lauren Newmeck and our colleagues uh, from the Park District that facilitated uh, my visit recently and kind of told me the story kind of warts and all, uh, and I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Okay, so it's almost lunchtime. So um, what I'm going to suggest that we do now, just as our panelists make, the, that make their way up to the table, um, I'm sure you have a lot of really interesting, relevant questions, right? And, and some of them are not going to be associated with the title of this particular topic, which is how wild should urban parks be? So if they're not, take it, put it in your pocket, pull it back out at lunchtime and address it to the various speakers then would be great. Um, and the other thing I suggest you do is, I don't know about you, but uh, I mean, I, I was awake all the way through, which I was really impressed. Um, <laughs> but I suggest everyone stand up for like 30 seconds, talk to your partner next to you, talk about the question you want to ask. If the person next to you gets excited, get ready to pose it. And remember to focus on this idea. Nice and done. <laughs> if they don't, <laughs> then just ditch it. But, um, it was but let, let's yeah. keep it, let's yeah. keep it really focused fun. on wild. The thing I took away, that is a I'll really let you guys go. <laughs> it's an odd project, right? It really is weird. Yeah. Okay. It's not going to be self-sustaining. Yeah. 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 But the degree to which it... Um, so always with these projects is, like, it's the amount of management that it's going to take. So it's not going to be self-sustaining. No, but yeah, like, no way. You know, we know that. Um, but, but it's about what's smart idea. Stuff. Yeah. yeah, that was a great Yeah. Small group work. Cool. Although they, they might yeah, it works in the class. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wish I could have. I, I kind of, you know, got rid of a couple of slides for time, but but. Uh, oh sure, yeah, yeah. So 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 the, the privilege, if you like, for being one of the panelists is um is, is that at the very very end, this is what um these guys are each going to give you a 15 second soundbite as you walk out to go to lunch. So if you really like it, you know, you can write it on a T-shirt or something, wear it around town. Um, but what we're going to start off with right now is just this topic of how wild. Um, kind of part B. And so just to sort of get the, the conversation going, you know, I took away um, from, from sitting in this talk is that, that they, they can't be wild. I like Susan's kind of unicorn is just that essentially it's just Disneyland. We can go in and we can put absolutely everything back, but essentially people and management will have to be an essential component. So the kind of the original idea around things like sort of Russian national parks that you leave wilderness as wilderness and no one is allowed access just isn't going to work within a city. Can I counter that? It's going to come with you. Yeah. I, no, I think, I think that's fundamentally right. But I, I, I would say that the, um, okay, so maybe this is a provocation that the, uh, the, the entire planet is an urban ecosystem at this point. It's, it's very difficult to imagine 
you know, wilderness in that sense of anything being left alone. I mean, so you, now you have kind of the weirdness of, you know, academic volumes on the restoration of wilderness. So, the, you know, we live on a managed planet, whether we like it or not. But it may, of course, be, you know, some things are going to be kind of scrupulously managed and require ongoing painstaking attention and some systems will be kind of a little bit more self-regulating but whether we like it or not I mean ultimately this is a managed and I don't think uh, that's probably not a controversial thing to say um, yeah and could, could I add one other thing that I wasn't able to touch upon on mine and it and it does echo your parks you know without borders is the whole idea of reconciliation ecology mm -hmm. and what we do in our own, you know, most of the land in a city is residential land and private, he privately held. So anyone who is lucky enough to own a home with a yard can play a role. And some neighborhoods even get together to play a role to save a species. So we can augment what goes on in, in parks and also it, with urban nature in general by uh, getting involved at, at outside of the parks. And, and uh, it... So it blends. It all becomes blended. So, and, and this is more tractable in certain size cities than perhaps others, but I just want to, the whole idea of reconciliation ecology, I think, is going to be uh, ascending soon. So. And all I'm going to add is uh, wild is uh, the definition you create. And so uh, I think there's all kinds of versions of wild and of nature uh, that are absolutely in our parks and can be more so. Um, and it really is about listening to and engaging the community um, in addition to the kind of the scientific aspects of what we know about restoration and landscapes. I think we already had a question, the first hand up there. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yes, hi. Uh, I'm with the uh, Miel School of Public Health. And in, in relation to uh, how wild urban parks should be, I'd like to point out that there are some uh, public health risks associated with these efforts as well as public health benefits. Examples of these risks, from my experience, has been the spread of Lyme disease from Westchester County down in the Prospect Park, New York. There's tr evidence, convincing evidence, that the expansion of Lyme disease from Wisconsin down in through uh, what, Illinois, in the Indiana, and now in the uh, southern uh, <coughs> Michigan, uh, through the Chicago uh, wilderness area, um, is, you know, a recent event. Um, there's, there's areas, two parks in New York City where uh, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is endemic, where there have been fatal cases. <coughs> uh, West Nile virus is an urban mosquito-borne disease, and areas where there are trees and birds are at higher risk than areas that are totally built. And the list goes on and on, particularly in the tropics. <coughs> so, so my question is, um, you know, would the panel agree that some of these uh, issues of public health risks should be addressed in management practices for for uh, uh, urban parks, and and how you would you go about accomplishing that? I mean, because I've never seen anything written about it or even discussed. Mm -hmm. And I know these comments are highly unpopular at these kinds of meetings because I've been booed out of a lot of them. <laughs> so I know, I know Suzanne's about to jump in and respond to that, so we're going to let her do that. But if there are people also in the audience who feel like th this is their expertise <laughs> and they want to throw it and they want to answer, stand up at that point. Don't wait for, for a microphone and feel free to engage. But Suzanne. I'm not going to let you bum me out, first of all. Um, but the reality is <clears throat> we were dealing with West Nile virus quite a bit. And um, if you have more dragonflies, you have less mosquitoes, first of all. Secondly, um, it, it's the proportional um, audience and proportional amount of illness. I don't mean to downplay it at all. Uh, all of those problems exist. Um, they'll be in nature, but we also have deer running in our suburbs and down streets now that carry those ticks. Um, so par part of the problem is is this isolated aspect of nature and the unhealthy nature that leads to that, which is also connected to monocultures, as an example. Um, I think it, it, to, to focus on that in our world is a very fear-based thing to do, just like keeping vegetation low in Jackson Park. Um, and then I will... Uh, counter on the other amazing public health benefits that have been researched quite a bit, including social benefits. Francis Quo at the University of Illinois has immediately demonstrated urban forestry canopy to reduction in crime. 
uh, Lake County Department of Public Health now is able to give prescriptions for walks in nature. They're nature scripts, and um, especially uh, for the elderly, and all the nature centers in the areas are now just completely bombarded with requests for nature walks. The reduction in cardiac and respiratory health issues, diabetes, et cetera. So um, I am not downplaying what you're saying. It's absolutely true as our cars and getting hit, in car, hit by cars. So I think understanding that population uh, that's impacted by these nature-born uh, diseases is important as understanding the public health benefits and the populations it impacts as well. Um, otherwise, um, the fear-based continues and, and the, um, the disconnect from kind of the realities of quality of life are, are lost in the conversation. Um, just from personal experience, uh, my boy got Lyme disease like three times um, before the age of three. And what that did was educate me on how to prevent it, mm -hmm. just the way he wears his pants, the kind of that he puts his socks over his pants. So a lot of it is education. And, and when you're in an urban setting, you're not used to having deer running into the Bronx, which now we have at the nursery. We've seen five five deer. So a lot of it is education on how to act in an area where there might be ticks. You know. Yeah, so, um, Am I on? Yeah. Um, I think that. Um, I got Lyme disease when I was at the forestry school, so I'm very intimate with this um, issue, and it took them about four weeks to diagnose it after saying a bunch of other things. Um, but I manage a project in Louisville, Kentucky, which I'm going to talk about, and one of the things is that when you build accessible and welcoming parks, you bring out many people who, to your point, don't have experience. So I know when I come out of the woods, the first thing I do is I go take a shower, I do a tick check, the next morning I do a tick check. Um, we have a lot of people that I call the white tennis shoe crowd, which are people who come out in these clean white tennis shoes that really have never hiked in a woodland before. They haven't been in a meadow. And we have a very simple solution to that, to the public health issue beyond sort of teaching about it, which is we clear our trails about twice as wide as the normal trail. So you're not brushing up against grass. You're not brushing up against an understory in the forest. So you're still getting a fairly authentic experience in the forest, but we recognize that these are probably people that aren't going to go home and do a tick check and so on. So um, I don't disagree with your comments about the, the public health risks. I think that you know, you shouldn't be booed. We ought to be open to, to the variety of perspectives if you're really going to manage successfully for an urban audience. But there are management things that you can do to still be somewhat authentic in your ecology and restoration, but also be cognizant of who your users are and what their needs are. Just like any kind of campaign, I, I want to go back and say, I did not boo you. I did not boo you. I think actually just public health as a conversation around nature is a great opportunity. And those kinds of discussions about preventing something is another way to introduce the issues around nature. You can't, so I just kind of just put a question out. Does anybody know? So that is interesting that you know, you've got a public health issue. Um, obviously, there are costs and benefits as well in terms of there may be some negatives of some public health, um, of some public health topics, but other bene benefits, and there are ways to manage for it. So has anyone done a quantitative analysis that says what is the sort of the overall outcome? There's going to be some winners and losers, but overall, is it a win? Is it a lose? Or do, is that something we don't know yet? In public health, you're saying? Yeah, in public yeah. health of, of, of rewilding cities. Mm. It's awesome. Well, I mean, it depends on how you look at it. I mean, I, you know, I mean, I'm fascinated by Until you're ticks academic. and mosquitoes <laughs> and pathogens. They're part of the ecosystem. And, uh, you know, they're just as valid. Uh, you know, some people like butterflies and birds. I like mosquitoes and ticks. I mean, and it would be better if other people would appreciate them and learn more about their biology and learn more about how things work in nature because diseases and pathogens are part of nature. Mm -hmm. um, they're separated, you know, academically. As I've learned here at Yale, between the School of Public Health and the Yale School of Forestry, um, but those bridges are important to to build between these disciplines. And, and what I'm saying is that I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not trying to scare people. I'm just saying these things exist. Mm -hmm. You should be aware of them, and they, and there should be some uh, consideration in management practices mm -hmm. because there are management practices that can move things in one direction or another. Yeah, and I, I may have kind of co complicated the issue here by I'm really interested in Bill Jordan's work in particular because he's kind of interested in kind of these very kind of existential 
questions. So for him, it's important to bring kind of the nasty stuff back into systems, at least theoretically, because, um, I mean, it, it kind of uh, allows this engagement with our finitude. It kind of reminds us of what it is to be humans. But practically speaking, I, I don't want my kids to be, you know, in a position where they have to consider their finitude at, you know, at, at a tender tender age. So I think the reality is, I mean, when you look at kind of plans for kind of some of this more novel park management that we're talking about, I mean, issues of public health, I think, are, are very much in the mind of, you know, the planners and designers. So, you know, I think like the discovery that the mosquitoes in Wooded Island are kind of uh, vectors, which of course they would be for all sorts of uh, unseemly diseases. I, 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 I think there is, a, you know, that, that triggers management uh, of them. And I don't think anyone would be kind of um, surprised or offended by that. Mm -hmm. Uh, going back to Dr. Hennigan's concept of like the wilderness, especially in um, parks and in the urban environment, um, what what exactly is the balance between real nature and fake wild, especially in in city green spaces? And I, I I wanted to phrase the question as in what is the role or the capacity for humans and people to to define what is the wild and to manage wilderness? What do you think are what do you think our role is in that in that process? Yeah, that's a lovely question. I mean, the of course, those of you who have spent time with the literature on wilderness, which is a literature that's evolved over, I mean, a long time, but kind of academically, maybe over the last hundred years or so, recognize that, you know, wilderness is one of those terms that seems so concrete at first, but um, ends up being actually pretty vague. I mean, the, at a national level, in the 60s, when the... Um, kind of wilderness areas were being designated on public lands, it turned out it'd be extremely difficult to implement the Wilderness Act precisely for the reasons that you're talking about. It's very hard to be concrete uh, about it. Roderick Nash, the historian of wilderness, I think says it ba best though that, you know, wilderness is very often just a feeling, right? You know, you kind of know wilderness when, you know, you have an experiential kind of uh, contact with it. And that, that, that's why, even though people are sometimes confused, befuddled um, by the um, notion of Chicago wilderness, you know, it seems oxymoronic. And yet at the same time, the, there, there, is, there are these opportunities to feel that you are kind of uh, enveloped in something bigger than you, that it delivers on the promises of wilderness even in an urban setting. One of my kind of big interests in this is is the fact that, um, and it's a hypothesis, I don't know the degree to which this has been tested, but my my feeling, of course, is that it's going to be very, very difficult uh, to get people interested in large-scale wilderness outside of cities if they have no contact with that feeling within the city. It's a great question. There's too too many things to say about it. So I know it's 12.15, but um, we've been told that the caterers will not take the cellophane off the sandwiches until 12.21, so it gives us an extra five minutes. Um, I see, done. <laughs> this is great. So you, you, you guys are captive here. So I, I, I wanted, So that's an interesting question about um, that point about the feeling of wilderness. So I just wondered if we could go back to the people in New York. So with, it, with this focus on, on restoring quality parks, and, and there's been an awful lot of outreach and discussion with the six different generations, how often does the <clears throat> feeling of wilderness come up when people were talk about quality?
we have a burning response there first. No, just, oh, maybe there. Just, just to add further about what people want in, in nature in New York City, we're also re restoring what was once the world's largest landfill into mm. a park. And people who were involved in planning for that park wanted desperately for it to stay natural. natural. For it to, because right now, we never know it was a landfill. Great name. Um, it, is, it is just one huge, glorious series of, of mountains and, and <laughs> areas, um, but people want it desperately um, to be wilderness, and they relate to that aspect. Of it. Good. Um. The last response is on the High Line. There's a whole section that had the native vegetation that grew there through the High Line. It's one of the most popular areas. Uh, it is just not even maintained. It allows this to grow, and people respond very well to what just grew up there organically. Well, there are people holding microphones right now, right? Um, maybe related to the idea of feeling in nature, I'm just wondering if in any of the work that you're doing, um, you know, if you're encountering uh, negative perceptions of bringing wilderness and, the, you know, those issues of safety and discomfort. Um, I know maybe someone mentioned uh, Joan Nassauer's work and her idea of orderly frames and stuff, but I'm just wondering, uh, you know, is there anything else relevant that's happening with, with that kind of perception that you're encountering with some of your projects? I can start. I, on, on the scale of, of Cherokee Park, we have um, Beargrass Creek running through it. Uh, the managers desperately wanted to not mow grass all the way to the riparian banks for many reasons, and they started certain areas for – the, the first education had to be with uh, Metro Parks people. They wanted and, – and the people who do the mowing. They want to mow the way they mow all the time. And uh, it took a while, but um, they finally let, you know, they planted with native grasses and, and other things there and had educational, you know, signage. And uh, now, and they would get complaints initially about some of these efforts and these, not, these efforts to put in meadows and things. But now people aren't, people are loving it. So I, at least in Louisville, over it may have taken about ten years, but um, they gradually, uh, you know, understand why it got installed that way, and it, there, there's changes going on. And, and it's I just talked to the, the manager about it a couple of months ago. He says, "Yeah, we don't get phone calls, you know, nasty phone calls anymore at all." So there may be hope for you know just continuing the effort and doing it. And and if uh, I can just make one remark about. Um, this concept of experiencing wilderness that when I was still in New York City area, um, I just want to, it's something that's never left me. We had 14-year-old uh, girls from the Bronx uh, come up a little bit ways out of the city for, um, you know, an educational thing that I was leading. And I was leading them into the woods, but I saw that a whole bunch of them stayed behind in this open kind of area with and they were a hubbub, and I went and say, well, what am I going to drag them here for? They're interested. What, what are they interested over there? It was um, a big patch of thistle in bloom, mm. okay? And what they were all excited about was the bees that were on it. They had never seen a bee. That has never left me. They were so, one girl, it was really cute. She did ask this question. She said, can I pet it? <laughs> And I said, no. And then later, go, really, I, that, has just, that was remarkable to me. Never left me, that experience. And we took them into the woods. Then later, which had Lyme disease, it was over at Calder Center. But they were, where, they were ready for it, but they wanted to go in there. And they caught a toad. And that was the best-loved toad in America for 15 <laughs> minutes as it went hand to hand. So uh, that's, in a small scale, an experience of wilderness like to share with you. So, so I have a quick comment, and yeah. I'd love to invoke Bob Pyle here, um, a graduate of the school and an environmental writer who wrote about the extinction of experience exactly as you're describing it, and having worked with URI here in New Haven, bringing some of those experiences um, to students. Uh, Bob Pyle's, I think his wild place was an urban ditch. Um, so just to honor wilderness at, at any scale. Yep. Mm -hmm. So Jennifer's gonna be our last person from the floor, and then I don't know why I did this to you guys. I apologize. We're going to get the 15-second sound bites before we walk out. Um, I just thought I, I've been thinking about, too, uh, another aspect of wilderness in the city, um, 
both of them related to equity and access. Um, one related to sort of what Liam was saying that, again, if there isn't wilderness in the city, um, then there, there may never be another opportunity for people to access it. They're, they don't have the opportunity to take their own car and go out to some of the other sort of extreme wilderness um, locations all over the country. So this is their chance. You know, Pelham Bay Park in the Bronx, mm -hmm. uh, Marine Park in, in, the, in Brooklyn, this is their chance. Um, and then the second sort of aspect to that in terms of equity is that when you look at a map of New York City in particular and you see where the natural areas are, they're on the edges of the city. They're, they're in the places where, as the commissioner has said before, that you, you haven't seen this sort of investment in our public spaces as much. It's not where the High Line is. It's not where Central Park is. It's not Brooklyn Bridge Park. They're on the edges. And these populations don't necessarily have access to these incredible um, places that have had great investment. So it, it does give you another way to create park experiences by taking advantage of wilderness in the city. Thanks. So we'll, we'll go in the same order the speakers came, so Margaret. Margaret. Oh dear. Um, well, I guess I would just sum it up as uh, nature in the city is as wild as you want to make it. Suzanne? Oh boy. <clears throat> I wanted to start with a quote from Mayor Richard M. Daley, who was my boss for 17 years. When we first started talking about nature, he said, is that where birds poop and something comes up? <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> evolving to a great advocate for nature. Um, and I, I, it, it builds off of what you just said and, and what the gentleman just asked. But the, the bottom line is, it is how you define it. It's making it accessible and comfortable and safe and something joyous because nobody wants to hang out in a place that's not fun, doesn't make them feel good. So there's both the aesthetic and the natural that need to come together. And we don't always, I believe, need to be so um, incredibly functioned on how incredibly biodiverse are that specific native species all the time because it's not necessarily as important. Great. Yeah, I, I think it's kind of useful to remember as well that um, like the wild can be bewildering, you know, so the, it's not, not necessarily going to be an unbefuddling thing for, for us. I mean, a lot of what we're talking about is, is what I would call like the intentional forest, you know, so we're kind of designing forests, but very often it's kind of the spontaneous nature and the spontaneous experience that emerges from what we do with design that's at stake here. So I would bear kind of in mind both the intentional and the spontaneous when thinking about these things. That's a lot of words for a t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to write poop and something yeah, comes up. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so I'd like to just thank our panel and our audience again at the end, and then bon appetit. I have so many quotes from